Sonia, thank you very much for joining uh, the lecture. Today we've got the great pleasure, uh, we've got the great guest, uh, Professor Henderika de Vries. Uh, she is a psychologist, uh, uh, she holds the PhD from the Sorbonne University in France, but she was also a Fulbright scholarship uh, doing her postdoctoral doctoral studies in Yale University, working with uh, world-famous scientist Hofstede on culture models. Uh, so today we've got really great pleasure to listen about uh, her research and to listen about uh, also her experiences in that field. Uh, and we've got uh, the topics, uh, the, today's topic is culture acculturation model creativity. Uh, so really, I am uh, waiting for, for your speech, Henrika, and it's really nice to have you here. And uh, I'm really honored that you accepted our invitation. Uh, and uh, only um, for everybody, uh, a short announcement, like or organizational announcement. Um, please uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, the lecture will be on, organized in that way, that uh, firstly, uh, Professor Henderika will uh, give a speech and after that uh, there will be a time for questions and for discussion uh, and please feel free to write questions even during uh, Professor Henderika de Vries speech on the chat box and uh, I will be reading these questions you ask after uh, Professor will finish uh, her speech so it's it's like that and if anybody has problem with writing questions in english it's also not a problem to write them in polish i can translate them so also please feel free to write in english or in polish uh, what language you prefer and uh, uh, i have uh, only uh, uh, sorry for that i have only one uh, information on chat box that there are some technical problems but I hope not. Okay, I hope not. I hope that everybody hear me and everything is visible. Uh, so, one again, uh, welcome Hendrika in our university, our virtual university now, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Agnieszka, and um, I'm very honored to be invited um, by also Professor Turska and uh, Agnieszka, who I know now already for some uh, longer time. And um, it's, um, it's, to be honest, I was looking yes, a bit on internet on uh, where your university is because I discovered it's a very cultural uh, region and must be so exciting uh, to, to see it in real. But I'm very honest uh, to be here uh, with you today and thank you for, uh, for joining uh, for this. This, um, for this lecture. Um, as uh, Agnieszka said, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, cult I started as a cultural researcher a long time ago and uh, then I worked um, in, in different, I, I wanted to gather experiences, maybe not the normal way of doing academia, but that was uh, my way. And um, I, I worked um, in uh, intercultural environments and um, but this question about cultural differences is something that is um, is my passion, and I found in creativity an interesting way to uh, to look at this. And so um, I, my the biggest question has all the time been: How does this cultural difference influence our thinking, our being, and yes, our creativity? Because if we look, for example, um, if you see simply art, right, in different parts of the world, you can see that they're just different traditions, different styles. And it's not just one person who paints like that, but it's a style of a, of a country, right? And But of course, creativity is much more because I don't know if you um, have an idea of how we could define creativity. Uh, we, in, in normal public, it would be nice to have some discussion, but uh, scientists um, who study creativity, they uh, agree on the idea that something has to be, uh, that it's a capacity to produce something new and original, but not only that, because otherwise it would just be uh, very weird, uh, but it should also be adapted to the constraint of a situation. So it should, and this can apply to very different things, right? Uh, so this is what we use in, um, when we study creativity, we use this definition most of the time, although there are about a hundred different definitions, by the way. <laughs> and um, 
If we look at cultural differences, we can uh, look at it in different ways. First, we can look at uh, the concept of uh, creativity, because that already is different in different countries. So if you ask someone um, in, uh, you know, um, in, for example, um, in, in Africa, um, uh, and you ask them, what is, what is for you creativity? They will say, well, it has to be a contribution to society. And this is already different because, for example, in Western uh, countries, we also think that there is, for example, a dark side to creativity. So um, malevolent uh, creative ideas. But in Africa, they would say, no, that's not creativity. It has to be something positive. So the concept itself is already very different. And uh, this is, uh, for example, um, uh, 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 an idea that uh, storytelling is really what is uh, that you contribute something ethical to a community. Um, so a very ethical uh, way is is something that is um, uh, an ethical message is again also something that is in, in African countries uh, very important. And um, in some cultures they say, well, only male uh, men can be creative and women can't be. For example, in Confucian um, um, uh, cultures, they say that uh, you know women are have to be more obedient in in the uh, ancient Confucian idea, and so this is not very helpful to be creative. So the concept itself is already different, and. Um, if we look, for example, in uh, I can just tell a little thing. Uh, the concept is also different in, cre in creativity. We say that you have a big C creativity, which is eminent creatives. Then you have uh, also small creativity, which is children in school. They are kind of being creative in their own little way. But we wouldn't say in science that they are already really creative because you need a lot more to be creative than just uh, what children have. They have to develop their creativity. And uh, this is, for example, also cultural difference. I, I just found that in um, Poland you have two words, for example, for creativity. This is not the case in every country. I think you have the, called twer uh, the word twerczuts. I don't, say, don't know if I say it right. And that means eminent creativity and you have kreativność. I don't say, I say it horribly wrong, but uh, this is for um, more everyday creativity. So this is something that doesn't exist in other uh, countries. It's very typical Polish uh, distinction between these two. And that's interesting because um, that is also a kind of, uh, you know, a self-development, a very small creativity. Uh, this is um, uh, also already a cultural difference. So we see the concept was very different. We have also very different domains. We in fact think that culture um, really channels creativity. So verbal creativity is in Arab countries, in poetry, in uh, story, uh, in writing, uh, very popular. But if you ask, for example, in um, in uh, Latin American uh, countries, what is for you creative? They say, well, if you're good at business, if you're good at marketing, if you ask in Turkey, what is for you really uh, a, a, a creative domain? They say technology and um, and uh, science. So, um, you know, it's already the domains where is creativity is very different. And um, if we, uh, oh, before we go to the evaluation, because you can, uh, we can also say, well, there are differences with how you how you kind of uh, judge creativity. I know this is sometimes a bit shocking feeling. I don't know how that is for you. When I started with creativity, I thought, oh no, are we really measuring creativity or last? Uh, you know, being really free and uh, something that we shouldn't be uh, want to judge or to measure. Um, but uh, luckily, we actually see that if you uh, if you do, the creativity only becomes more. So it's not judging in a way of good or bad, but in a way of making it more important. And um, so the evaluation, how you judge creativity, there have been studies uh, to compare are there differences, and there, most of them have bet have been between um, you know Eastern and Western. But actually, the judgment of creativity is quite the same. Uh, um, uh, for example, they, they asked uh, on Van Gogh paintings in um, New and Sternberg and uh, or in, in other in, uh, in, uh, in paintings in general. But I know another study uh, about that. And you know, people um, it means that people would judge it the same, and it can kind of explain why some painter who is world known will still be popular with uh, many different cultures. That's what I mean. And um, 
uh, there's also, in fact, what I tell you, uh, what you can hear is I give you different uh, little just directions and, uh, you know, um, what we're looking uh, for, because it's still quite at the beginning, this, um, this uh, field. We really have so much more still to understand about how culture and creativity are connected. Uh, for example, in some uh, cultures, like in Eastern cultures there and in um, uh, in the Hindu culture, the process is sometimes more important than the result. And um, what we see when we say something has to be novel and appropriate, in some cultures that is very novel is more important than that is appropriate. For example, if we look at uh, China and you think, uh, you know, you hear in business that they're copying uh, a lot of things for them, that's actually a very creative act because in China, you know, the, um, there is a whole tradition of doing something like someone else in a maybe bit new way, but only a little bit new, not very new. So for them, you know, we could think from our perspective that uh, they are copying, but they just think they are honoring creativity, maybe, right? So it's uh, all these perspectives are, uh, in, in that sense, uh, also that is also how I look at culture differences, is that uh, every culture is something, for me, like a work of art. You know, I think culture and creativity are so much related that we could see a culture, um, uh, although it's not really um, protected by the UNESCO as an immaterial, um, uh, you know, a cultural uh, a treasure, but I think that the, cult the, the cultural values, how cultures have evolved, that that is actually in itself a work of art. So that is how I look at it. I don't look at a, one culture being better than the other. And I think a strength is always also a weakness in another way. So, um, so, uh, so another way we looked at, uh, or that uh, scientists look at, uh, at the difference is to really, so this is the thing, that's why I say about cultures are all different and they have advantages and disadvantages or strengths and, um, and uh, weaknesses if you want. But, um, of course, there are some studies who look at is one culture more creative than another culture? And if you look at that, there are differences found. Some are better at divergent thinking, others more at convergent thinking. Um, and, you know, uh, United States would be more divergent thinking than, for example, in uh, Iran. And, um, and also China, United States, there are uh, some differences found. But there are so many buts because first are we, because we know now that there are so many differences in what is creativity. We don't, you know, what is, uh, what are you really measuring and are we measuring it the right way? So the comparative studies have to be taken very carefully and um, it's not the aim, I think, of cultural differences to find who is better than someone else, but rather what is the specific, you know, uh, specialty of a culture and um, and how can we learn from that? So that is the way uh, I personally uh, look at these uh, differences. Um, I have to say there's another way of looking at uh, cultures, um, but we'll get to get to that a bit later. Um, so if we now look, uh, I, uh, because it's a lecture, maybe I could just tell you a little bit how we, uh, what we see um, if someone is creative. Psychologists have found a lot of factors that contribute to someone if someone is creative. So, um, and we call this the multivariate theory of creativity from Sternberg and Lubert. And um, there are cognitive factors, so you have to have some knowledge, but too much knowledge is not always too good. You have to have intelligence, intelligence, uh, a minimum amount of intelligence, but uh, after about 120, 125, there's no real correlation. So you can be extremely smart, but maybe not as as creative. Uh, so that is really a different, um, you know, uh, different um, ability. And there is, uh, you know, effective uh, factors, you know, mood and emotion regulation. You, you all know probably, especially now the COVID, if you have to do something, you can go through this idea of, oh, this is easy. Oh, this is really not easy. Oh, I cannot do it. And then you think, oh, I, I'm really terrible. And then you have to get up again and do it again. So there's a whole emotion uh, regulation uh, note needed. And um, of course, environment, so culture and context. And also, actually, I would say um, time. So, you know, uh, 
uh, there has, it has to be, you can be creative, a specific day, time, uh, everything is right in that moment, right? So uh, it's, it's really lucky if you can be uh, creative at a certain moment in time, in fact, where everything comes together. And finally, there are some cognitive factors like motivation, personality. We know that people are very open, are very, or have a, uh, you know, is a predictor of uh, having creative uh, potential. And also, and that's something that interests me uh, very much and uh, is tolerance of ambiguity. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. I will just tell a little bit more about this because um, this comes uh, also to the, uh, uh, this is such an interesting thing. I thought so fascinating because both uh, tolerance of ambiguity at an individual level, it exists also at a um, cultural level. And they are, it's together with openness, the biggest create, uh, predictor of creative um, potential, but it's not, not enough research, I would say today. And so these are the two people that have inspired me uh, for this because um, Elsa Frankel Brunswick, she started with this. It was after the Second World War. They were trying to understand the authoritarian personality type. So Tons of Miguiti is predicts creativity, but it's also very interesting in even in today, you know, how can we uh, make sure that we don't have dictators, that we don't have authoritarian regimes. And so understanding this tools of ambiguity concept is uh, something very important for that. And it has to do with tolerance of uncertainty, ambiguity, which are all, uh, you know, at the moment very actual. And uh, Geert Hofstede, I, I had the chance to work with him. He passed away uh, last year, uh, sadly, and um, but he was still part of my um, of my uh, doctoral uh, thesis uh, committee. And um, Yes, they, uh, that's a very inspiring and incredibly uh, kind uh, person to, to work with, very ethical. I've never met someone as ethical as him <laughs> in academia, I have to say. So that was very special. And um, so maybe I give you a very small uh, lesson about culture from uh, uh, Geert Hofstede, how he saw it. Um, so if you look at the cultural dimension of uncertainty avoidance, you see he, he said his idea was, look, societies have to uh, solve problems. These problems are gender or roles, you know, in society, hierarchy, so uh, who's more important than others, and you have to solve conflicts. That was, uh, this was something that anthropologists had already found out. And then he said, and if you look at, um, at the dangers of what we don't know what happens tomorrow, we don't know what happens in one hour. And so he said, there's a danger of nature, you know, there can happen something. There's also the danger of other human beings. And there's a danger of, you know, the unknown realm or, uh, you know, uh, transcendental forces. And he said, so that is why every culture will create values and these values will then again determine how someone is supposed to feel, think and act to belong to this group. So it doesn't mean that every individual thinks like that, obviously, but this is, this is the way that uh, Geert Hofstede saw um, how uh, cultures, uh, why they create all such different values, but they all have for this uh, dimension of uncertainty avoidance, uh, which is related to terms of ambiguity, they have to um, to uh, to solve this problem of the danger of uncertainty. And um, in fact, uh, to make it easy, if um, a bit more simple, is ambiguity or uncertainty. As a human, we can react to to something uh, in an anxious way or in a curious way. Like I've not really done this uh, through teams, as you can see. So I also try to tell myself, okay, this is um, curious how it will go and I hope it goes well for you. And, um, but at the same time, I could also just be very scared and uh, you know, that will uh, limit of course uh, uh, to how to do it. So this is what we call tolerance of ambiguity. In a moment of uncertainty, are you reacting with anxious um, attitude or curious. And so on an individual level, this um, um, uh, Franker Brunswick, she said, it's when parents are very, very strict, then you can, you start to think only as uh, black and white. So you cannot see anymore all the different colors. And because you cannot do that, your creativity now also becomes limited. And so this was her idea of how it really comes about from too rigid parenting. So if you think also of dictatorship, you know, um, there were also maybe rigid parenting uh, backgrounds, right? And so uh, in a society, uh, Geert would say, the extent to which the members of a culture feel threatened by ambiguous or unknown situations and the resistance to change. 
And um, I just like as an example, you have Australia, for example. I don't know if you, if any of you uh, uh, know this, uh, for sure you do. And there's, they have these special drawings. And you know, these drawings are actually very regulated. And it's such an interesting case because Australia has very um, high uncertainty avoidance. So they are not tolerant to ambiguity and one of the highest of the whole world that we know. So an artist can, for example, only make a little, uh, you see these U shapes, that's uh, where uh, they sit uh, together, I think, and they all have different meanings. And every artist can only do one thing and, um, you know, in a certain color. And so it's very, very strict. So very not tolerant to ambiguity. And you see them here drawing, right, the Aboriginals. But at the same time, this is what the culture asks from them. But this, in, uh, this is an example here of an Aboriginal person who actually can draw very free and very abstract and no rules at all. So it's this interesting thing of the individual and what the culture expects from you that is, I think, uh, fascinating. And now we come to um, uh, the development of creativity. So that is something that I've been um, thinking and, and working on uh, the last uh, years. Um, another subject where really we have so much more to discover, although uh, even if there's so much already uh, thought about it, we still don't, especially the development in different cultures, how it works. So my aim was not to find who is more creative than another, but how does the cultural rules, these values, how do they kind of push you into one or another direction? And so um, I worked at the time in an international school. You can see the hallway and every class was a different country, also Polish section we had uh, there. And so there is teachers, parents, students, all in a little uh, French, uh, you know, environment or in a Spanish environment. And I was um, working uh, not as a teacher, so I was a lot in all these different environments. And from there, from this experience, I made my research. And um, it was so interesting to see the same subjects told in just different ways, you know, and how, how the teacher was acting, how the students were reacting, you know, and you can teach, you can see classes uh, where, you know, uh, the tradition is in the Swedish classes that children just lay on the ground or sit on the chair of the teacher. And, but then you come to a French class where everything is much more strict. They have to stand up when a teacher comes in and say, hello, Mrs. So-and-so, you know, and so they were all very, um, very, very different atmospheres. Of course, every teacher is different, but I do think that there were also cultural, um, uh, you know, traditions, especially in education. And so I was looking at scientific creativity. You can see uh, this is just um, uh, so and the, the, the concepts were scientific creativity, the cultural differences and the terms of ambiguity, this combination. And uh, what do we say when we say scientific creativity? Well, um, this is best explained through the four P's, we call them person, process, product and place. So. Um, uh, for the, the person, you look at what kind of, uh, you know, uh, factors are playing a role. The process of creative process of divergence. Divergent thinking means having a lot of different ideas. Convergence is putting them together in some kind of theory, putting it all together, you could say. Then you have uh, to synthesize it. You have cognitive process of meta, you know, this is, we don't need uh, for now, but there's specific cognitions, um, you know, like uh, Janusian thinking. It's like this gold who looked at in two directions at the same time. And uh, this is something, for example, Einstein would do, uh, you know, to think of two very different things. How can we solve that actually these very seems opposing things are in fact, is, is one thing. And so this is the news in thinking and scientific uh, cognition. Uh, so we have specific cognitions for um, uh, that also as scientists, uh, uh, you all uh, are using uh, every day analogies, uh, associations, uh, and so on. And um, so uh, when we look at uh, what is the product of scientific creativity, well, everything you know you do as a scientist is making theories, doing tests, uh, hypotheses, everything. And uh, we can study it, of course, in schools, little scientists and uh, in university. And so uh, I looked at um, how uh, the divergence for, for here, I will we have, don't have enough time for more, I think, but I will look here for the divergent part of um, uh, of the production. So how many different ideas can you make? Not uh, how can you put it all together, but how, how many different ideas? And um, um, 
This was done by um, using um, Todd Lubert's um, APOC science test. And there was a specific rock question, which was uh, like how uh, it had to do with if, if one stone breaks easier than another rock, what could be a reason? So this is a very specific and quite a difficult question. And some people said, yeah, but that's just a question for boys. Uh, girls don't like it. But uh, I can tell you that girls also liked it. Um, first of all, um, there was one girl who said, well, first you have to get the rock. And that's very difficult because they're in, uh, in very expensive shops. <laughs> And then if you have the rock, it's very difficult to break. It's, she was thinking of uh, more diamonds and stuff, right? So uh, it, not, it didn't mean that only boys were thinking of rock. So we didn't also find, um, you know, uh, gender differences there. And so uh, this question uh, was so interesting because looking at all the answers of, uh, of, uh, of students, uh, what we uh, saw was that there were children who who said answers only about what they could see. So the color, the shape, the, you know, if it was small or large. And so only observable properties, the surface kind of ideas. You had also children who actually answered with all kinds of processes. So they said you can smash it uh, with a wrecking ball uh, or they saw a process over time. And um, so they, they, they described all kinds of processes. And then we had a peop uh, children who said, something of the inside, something abstract, which you cannot see. And so they saw, uh, you know, more the atoms inside or uh, the structures of the molecules. And um, and this was, uh, these categories um, were um, they actually directly there. If you think of the theory of what uh, cultural values, uh, what they do, um, if I can make myself clear, they really uh, want you, you to kind of notice something and not notice something else, right? So uh, to in order that you belong to the group, you have to have these strict rules, which are in fact embedded in these values. And so you are trained to see something, but you're not trained to see something else. So it's not because you are, cannot think really well or you're not intelligent, but you're trained to look to see something or not to see something. And this is so interesting because every culture sees in fact something a bit different. So we need all cultures to really discover what, you know, more of reality because we're all growing up in a culture, luckily, because without a culture it would uh, be worse. But if we grow up in a culture, it also means we're limited. Our consciousness, you know, what we can see is also going in one direction and, um, and other cultures can teach us to see more. And so here I wanted to understand um, uh, with these uh, different categories uh, that children answered with. Sometimes they said a long answer and there were uh, different, uh, not only core ideas or process ideas or surface ideas, but all of them. And so um, just to see what was now the most creative, um, uh, some, um, you know, it was about uh, 200 students. Um, this was so. This was not um, expert judges, but more uh, simply students who were asked, "What do you think is the most creative?" And we we made a, um, uh, you know, a three different um, levels of very creative, medium creative, and less creative. And they all thought that the core ideas were the most creative, but also some process ideas. But if we looked at the ideas statistically, because judging creativity you can do in a lot of ways. And I here looked only at the statistic way. You can see that the ideas that actually have um, uh, a process idea in it, so who can describe a process, they were the most original, so scientifically. And um, if we look at um, the groups were uh, uh, too small to have them, uh, to be able to see uh, significant differences of terms of ambiguity related with these special categories. But we do see that terms of ambiguity has to do with the process, um, adding a process idea. So someone who's very tolerant to uncertainty, ambiguity, will easier describe a process in when they have a creative idea. They see a process in their uh, cognition happening. And um, so, um, yeah, so this was the category of the answers. And of course, now it was so interesting to see. Yes, but now we have this category, so not who is more or less creative, but more 
are there children who are already trained in seeing only you know what you can see or already trained in thinking in processes so it was a, uh, the, the next thing was to have a study in different um, parts of the world and so we had Indian Thai and France students and later also Russian students and what we found and we used so this is uh, the same uh, instruments used and um, we we suspected or we thought uh, hypothesized that uh, there are uh, you know culture differences in tulbas of ambiguity uh, and also that there will be differences in surface process and core answers and what we found was um, first of all um, that tools of ambiguity and uncertainty for this as you remember it was an individual level or the cultural group level they kind of corresponded and this is just the beginning of understanding because we still don't really know how tools of ambiguity is actually related to the different levels of uh, research this is a whole a lot of re more research I would advocate for uh, tools of ambiguity because there's so much we need we need to understand and so this is just the first idea but it came um, existing values were uh, corresponding with what we found there uh, especially in India was significantly different from the other two countries and um, we also then found that in India uh, children had more creative uh, ideas that were about what you can see so not about process or core ideas but what you can see like this stone the outside and um, they had the least um, of process answers so that one makes it creative so although for example in India they had a lot of ideas but they were all just surface ideas so this changes also the way we um, actually have to uh, measure creativity because you know if you can say between countries so here you see that if you would say well India is much more creative than uh, Luxembourg for example where I'm, I'm based uh, for, and um, then uh, you know we have to see yeah but what kind of what kind of answer are you actually giving? So it makes uh, judging creativity at once a little bit different. And um, we saw that in Thailand, a lot of, um, they had uh, significantly more core ideas, which makes uh, very creative ideas. And uh, so there were, and later we found for Russia here, you can see, I don't, I don't know if you can read it or, but you can see that the pattern is very different from the kind of answers that uh, students were giving. So especially in Russia, they gave actually uh, very creative answers because they said uh, ideas were that uh, had an, a core idea, a surface idea, and a process idea the most. So um, it actually was, I thought, a very surprising, um, uh, very, very creative. Uh, it was so surprising because children in Russia they don't get um, science lessons, um, many science lessons until they're about 11 to 14 years old. And in other countries, like in the United States, they think you have already to have science lessons in kindergarten. And so we see in Russia a much more creative answer, a scientific creative answer. So that's a very interesting, I think. And um, so this brought me to um, to think of culture as a as an actuation um, model. So in fact, uh, I think like in uh, in physics, you know, yeah, uh, the actuator is probably the child because the child can still uh, have some uh, freedom, but uh, culture is uh, is an, is actuating certain creativities more than other creati creativities and um, we can see how uh, this then uh, you know gets different colors of creativity in the end in um, in, in different um, in different cultures so um, again I want to say it's not about uh, saying one culture is better than the others because we know it's in different domains and for another domain it could be again very different but I do think that culture is uh, underestimated and uh, um, I would rather say we have to investigate it more than less because there's today uh, this idea of uh, culture is, uh, you know, we have to do as if we're all the same, which is great when times are great, but when times are not so good, uh, like we see with uh, with England and the COVID vaccine, uh, it's, we have to be very careful we don't get conflict. So rather than, uh, you know, rather than uh, just dismissing that there are, uh, you know, we're going through a world where everything is, is the same, I would rather say treat it as a as a uh, treat it as a as a work of art itself these cultures and investigate them more so we can learn from each other and um, so the conclusion is that 
uh, children already at nine and ten years of old already are thinking in different directions, culturally, uh, you know, related, and um, processes are important for creative uh, scientific creativity, and we still need to know so much more about tools of ambiguity and, um, you know, how it's related in different cultures in different domains uh, of creativity. So, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>